It's the biggest burglary in British history. What they were doing really was something beyond what had really been attempted before. It's a Hollywood screenplay. £14 million worth of jewellery, gemstones and gold stolen from the heart of the UK diamond industry. To do that in garden, that's a little bit special. Let's make no mistake about it, they didn't think they were going to get caught. Following today's verdicts, which saw three more members of the gang responsible sent down. This is the full inside story of how they pulled off last Easter's record-breaking heist. The way in which it played itself out was a very British story. They had to do a lot of intelligence work on that. I mean, these are not morons who've done this. With exclusive access to the elite flying squad. It became immediately apparent that it's definitely a job for us. Silently they come, swiftly they go. And their dramatic investigation. They didn't know that we were following them. So for us, obviously, it was a gold mine of evidence and information including never seen before surveillance of the thieves boasting of what they've done. And you think, I'm the, I've learnt more than the Prime Minister. I'm a rock star. And these were white working class guys committing crime. It was old school. And the moment loot was discovered hidden in a cemetery. They thought that this was foolproof. They thought they were going to get away with it. In their minds, they've got an audacious, cunning, sophisticated plot that would net them considerable wealth. And, and the kudos that goes with it. It's a classic caper from a bygone era. Once you're in there, it's like a kid of Christmas, isn't it, opening up presents? What they were doing really was something out there. When cops and robbers played cat and mouse, each side reckoning it could outsmart the other. This is the definitive story of the Bad Dad's Army and the Hatton Garden heist. <laughs> So who could have possibly pulled off Britain's biggest jewellery heist? Organised crime groups from Russia or Eastern Europe? No one expected it to be a group of old geezers in their 60s and 70s. Well, I was quite surprised. Uh, um, they were obviously uh, uh, elderly, but they were career criminals. Uh, uh, and it was certainly my impression this was one last hurrah for them to, to, to undertake. And it was in fact their pension pot. The lure was too good, the greed was there. They probably thought they were invincible and arrogance kicked in, and they were given an opportunity to, to, to one last hurrah. I think you can compare it with, um, with old boxers, you know, they retire, but they get an offer to go back in the ring one more time for a big prize, and this was a big prize. Together, the gang conspired to break into a vault in the centre of London's jewellery trade. To take on such an audacious job would need experienced thieves with previous form. First up, Brian Reader, dubbed by the others as the master. Age 76, he's the old man in the gang. As early as 2012, he started planning the Hatton Garden heist. I mean, he's been described as the governor, the master. Uh, the organiser, he would see himself as the top of the tree in this group. He's a career criminal. He has previous convictions, notably for uh, being involved in the Brinks Matt robbery. In 1983, six armed men in Balaclava stole gold, cash, and jewellery from a warehouse at Heathrow Airport. Reader's involvement in the Brinks Matt theft was an indication of the same sort of desire to carry out the big, dramatic crime that gets him remembered. Reader was sentenced to eight years for handling some of the stolen bullion. What we know of this gang is you've got Brian Reader, who's the master, who would have identified the skills required for this particular uh, criminal enterprise, and it's his contacts within the criminal underworld that would have then put that team together. Next, they needed a lookout and a 74-year-old John Kenny Collins. He would recce Hatton Garden to check out the premises. Collins would also be the all-important getaway driver and was again a man with form. John Collins uh, has been convicted of robbery on two occasions. Second occasion, it was armed robbery on a jeweler's. He again has got a significant criminal pedigree. Daniel Jones was the muscles. 
He was at the heart of extensive planning and would be instrumental in gaining access to the vault. Daniel Jones is again uh, an organised criminal. Um, he has spent a certain amount of time in, in prison. He's the younger, he's the fitter, and that's what he brings to the group. 67-year-old Terence Perkins would take on responsibility for the drilling. He's also got form and was jailed for 22 years. He was arrested in the early 80s and convicted for uh, an armed robbery at a secure call depot. Six males went in there with a sawn off shotguns over an Easter Bank Holiday weekend again and stole uh, almost £7 million. So he's got considerable criminal history. And then there's red haired Basil, a mysterious character. His true identity is unknown and he remains at large. Basil is, uh, is the name given to him by the uh, co-defendants, whether that's his real name or not, will, uh, will soon be established with hope. Each of the gang members had their role to play. You've got the four main players here. They've got the background, they've got the connections, they've got the networking in the criminal underworld that can put all of these components together and, and mastermind the job. We know that within criminal gangs, people have different sorts of responsibilities, but also that psychologically, people play different roles. People are important in keeping the gang together in different ways. And the success of a gang is very much dependent on getting that delicate balance just right. Over pints in the castle pub in Islington, North London, the men would spend hours plotting their master plan to pull off an audacious career-topping heist they boasted the world would never forget. They're looking at tremendous wealth. They're also looking towards laying down the, the bragging rights within the criminal fraternity of committing and getting away with Britain's biggest heist. So what's the code then, boy? What have you got? This is our target. It's a vault in the heart of Hatton Garden. There are two security guards. We're going to wait till they lock up and go. Our man has a key and he gets us in through the front door. Our man inside is Basil. He gets us through the fire escape. Then to the lift, we disable it and get us access to the shaft. Then it's down a level to the vault. We cut through the alarm wires, force the gate to the vault door, and then there's just a little matter of a reinforced concrete wall. We're gonna drill through it. Smash open the security boxes, and we get out. Any questions? As they talk through the details, uh, it starts to become tangible. It starts to become real. It starts to actually become possible that they're really going to do this uh, crime, which, which is just considered not possible. They do a lot of intelligence work on that. I mean, these are not morons who've done this. But what will give them the greatest notoriety but respect in, in the criminal underworld is that it's a crime without violence. Their target, Hatton Garden in central London. The area has been the centre of the diamond industry for centuries. Today, around 300 businesses are based there, representing one of the largest clusters of jewellery retailers in the UK. As such, it's long been a favourite target for thieves. In an effort to stop them, a cutting edge high security vault was built in the 1940s in the basement of 88 to 90 Hatton Garden. With London now a world centre for diamonds, jewel bandits have made this city thoroughfare their favourite target. To foil the thieves, Hatton Garden now has its own giant strong room. A two foot wide bomb and burglar proof door opens up a labyrinth of safes. It's the only one of its kind in Britain. Nearly a thousand individual safes are contained within this mass of steel and reinforced concrete. Jewel thieves will have to transfer their activities to other countries. Today, the vault contains almost a thousand safety deposit boxes full of cash, gold, diamonds and gemstones. 
the vast majority belonging to Hatton Garden jewellers. Hatton Garden is really where we get all our stones, all our material, whether it's chains, anything that we need, tools we get from Hatton Garden. Hatton Garden is the centre of the jewellery trade in, in, in the UK and has been since medieval times. So it's not rocket science to know that if, if you've got a vault in Hatton Garden that this is going to be uh, packed full of goodies, that the prize is going to be huge. You know, England, sort of, I don't know, Tower of London, the diamonds. And it's a little bit of a boast, really, that you've had Hatton Garden over. You know, they, they could have you know, stuck up a jeweller shop, but to do out in the garden, that's a little bit special. The audacity of the crime in terms of the planning, the professionalism of the way that the crime was carried out, it's right up there uh, near the top. It really is. By selecting this target, they were planning a job that would put them right up there, alongside Britain's most ambitious ever heists, including the notorious 1963 Great Train Robbery, the foiled Millennium Dome diamond theft in 2000 and the £53 million raid on the Securitas cash depot in Kent in 2006. The master plan was to be carried out over the Easter weekend when the gang knew the vaults would be full and the area quiet. On Thursday the 2nd of April 2015, Brian the master reader boarded the number 96 bus, heading in the direction of Hatton Garden. In the days and hours before the crime, it would have become part of their identity, what they were going to do and the roles that they were going to adopt. And you end up with a sense of destiny, a sense of elation. They were finally going to act out something um, that they had long anticipated, um, and it would have been an almost unreal feeling. Let's make no mistake about it, they didn't think they were going to get caught. They thought that this, this was foolproof, they thought they were going to get away with it. Around the same time, security guards at the Hatton Garden safe deposit were locking the vault. The security guard was the last to leave at 6pm. He wasn't due to return until Tuesday the 7th, four days later. The master arrived in the Hatton Garden area and met with the rest of the gang, disguised as workmen. The heist was finally in motion. Enter red-haired Basil. At 9.22, he gains access to the building. To this day, it's not known exactly how he did it. But once inside, he opened the fire escape and let the others in. The gang began to put their master plan into action. They sent the lift up to the second floor, then disabled the sensor so the doors wouldn't close and the lift couldn't move. They even left a handwritten out of order sign in case it was discovered. With the lift stuck on the second floor, they were able to access the lift shaft with a clear drop straight down into the basement. It's Fort Jones and Basil, the fittest of the gang, scrambled down. Despite initial news reports, there was no abseiling. They were now a step closer to a vault full of millions of pounds worth of jewels, gold and cash. Stage one complete but they still had several obstacles between them and their reward. Next, the intruder alarm. This, they attempted to deactivate by cutting through a telephone cable and snapping the backup transmitter's aerial. They then cut the power cable to a magnetic lock on an iron gate and smashed for a wooden door to allow the rest of the gang who hadn't come down the lift shaft through. Using an angle grinder, they cut for a second metal gate which protected the actual vault. Then all that was between them and the loop was the vault door and a concrete wall. Half a metre thick and reinforced with steel. They'd come prepared, equipped with heavy cutting gear. To access the diamonds, 
They use the diamond, a specialist diamond-tipped high-powered coring drill designed to penetrate concrete and stone. The drill is fitted with metal teeth known as cores, which grind away at the surface to create a hole. It's capable of spinning at 667 RPM in top gear and features a water cooling system to prevent it from overheating. They plan to drill a hole 25 centimeters by 45 centimeters in the wall, just big enough for someone small to squeeze through. It was a skill the pensioners had picked up by watching clips on YouTube. Unbeknown to the gang, shortly after midnight on April the 3rd, the alarm that attempted to deactivate was triggered and sent a text message alert. A security guard responded nearly an hour later. After examining the front door and peering through a letterbox, he decided the building was secure and left without going inside. Hello? Yep, all good here. False alarm. The police were also notified of the alarm, but the call wasn't graded properly, which meant they didn't think they needed to respond. All the while, the thieves in the basement remained blissfully unaware of their lucky escape and continued breaking into the vault. Their good fortune was short-lived. When they finally drilled their way through the reinforced concrete wall of the vault, they faced yet another obstacle. The back of the safe deposit boxes, which were bolted to the ceiling and floor, were blocking the hole and their way in. After almost 11 hours, they gave up and left at around 8am, empty-handed. This is where personality comes to play uh, and, and interacts with the roles that they've learnt and absorbed into themselves. And there are two different ways in which that can operate. For some of them, the failure to master the environment, the situation, will not be something that they can cope with and they will simply withdraw. For others, the mistakes, the errors, the things going wrong are actually part of the whole challenge and they will rise to the challenge. To walk away from that prize when you're, when you're so close, very, very difficult, very difficult in, in, indeed. But by the same token, the longer they're in the vault, the longer they're actually on the premises, then the chances of getting caught is raised uh, considerably. For a day and a half, their crime, half complete, lay undiscovered. But temptation would prove too great. They broke one of the basic rules of the criminal world and returned to the scene of the crime. So they psych themselves up once to do the job, then they've got to go away and then come back again. Uh, <laughs> Amazingly cool head to be able to to be able to actually carry that out. Now. Very very difficult because the risk is getting higher all the time. They came back with yet more gear. Using a hydraulic ram, they were able to dislodge the metal cabinets blocking the drilled hole. They were finally in, but they weren't all there to enjoy the moment. Brian, the master reader, had stayed away, having apparently lost his nerve. He wasn't there to see his plan come good. We know the reader walked away from it on that first night and didn't come back. It would be interesting to see whether that was a complete loss of bottle or whether he, he saw the writing on the wall and saw that, you know, that they, there was a vulnerability to being caught on the premises, having to go back a second time. At the time, it sounds good when you're playing in it, but when you've had a pop and it ain't worked and you, then you reflect back, the glamour's gone out of it and you're looking at the reality of it, that's a different ball game. And if people looked at the reality of it, they'd never do it in the first place. 
And when things start to go wrong, for some of them, the damage to their pride will have been too much. They, they will have been compromised um, and they will no longer be committed to the storyline and they will withdraw. The hole would have been a tight squeeze. It's full only Jones, the muscles and the mysterious Basil actually entered the vault. Once inside, they forced open 73 safety deposit boxes, filling bags and even wheelie bins with jewels, gold, precious stones and cash. Once you're in there, it's like a kid at Christmas, isn't it, opening up presents? They just pop in boxes and inside the boxes, there's all prizes. One of the interesting things about the case is that a relatively small number of the deposit boxes were broken into. Given the amount of time that they were in there, the deposit boxes are not hard to break into once you're actually in the vault. I don't know if they felt that they had enough money, enough jewels and enough loot, or if they were targeting certain boxes. It's interesting. They loaded up their loot, worth an astonishing £14 million, and hauled it up the stairs, leaving via the fire escape. They're done. It was by far the biggest payday of their career, and incredibly, it looked like they got away with it. Another two days went by before the theft was finally discovered. On Tuesday, the 7th of April, security guards arrived for work at around 8 o'clock. They called the police, triggering a major investigation by the elite flying squad. It was a burger in Hatton Garden, it was, it was going to be high value, and so we decided straight away, yes, we'd take it, get down there, assess it, and then we'll develop it from there. You know, within a few hours, it became apparent that it was a really serious crime and that it's definitely a job for us. The flying squad was formed in 1919. There's a neat little job, you two. Now, where are you going? Let's just inquiry, will you? We're on it now, sir. And they called the flying squad because they uh, went over different boroughs, so there was no boundaries to where they could uh, actually go to. And it's pretty much today's the people that we recruit onto the flying squad are thief takers. You know, they can get that evidence together, uh, you know, that, to successfully prosecute people that uh, um, uh, go to court. In Cockney rhyming slang, the flying squad is Sweeney Todd, i.e. the Sweeney. They were the first police to use cars and became famous for their contacts with the criminal underworld. They were renowned for swooping in and catching criminals red-handed. The Flying Squad's logo, the Swooping Eagle, depicts silently they come, swiftly they go, picking off their prey and, and taking them off. The romanticism is an important part because everybody who's on it knows that you're representing that legacy over the years. You know that people, Flying Squad were involved in the Great Trade Robbery, they know they're involved in the Brinks Mat, you know that the Flying Squad's been involved in the Dome Robbery, and what you want to do as um, an officer on it at this point in time is you want to perpetuate that legacy. So first of all, you, you do feel that ownership and responsibility to make sure the investigations that you are doing are top drawer. The Flying Squad operate against the most violent organised criminals that, that London have. They've built up a reputation over many years. You know, there isn't a major robbery that hasn't been solved by the Flying Squad um, using their expertise. They've been the Millennium Dome. There's been some of the Heathrow robberies that we've been involved in where we've successfully arrested and prosecuted individuals doing high value bullion raids uh, within the Heathrow uh, airport area. And there's been the Graffs, which was quite an audacious attack on Graffs jewellery, where two individuals tried to conceal who they actually were, and they ended up being arrested and, and, and convicted. Um, and so over a history, there's you know really deep history of the Flying Squad being successful. The scale of what the Hatton Garden thieves had got away with made headlines around the world. The Flying Squad were in the spotlight once more. This crime has been three years in the planning for them. 
but we have to hit the ground running. We've got victims. A lot of these victims, it was clear early on, were going to be significantly financially affected by this. So straight away, there is the pressure um, of those people turning up, having heard that it had been broken into, and you can see the devastation and what it meant to them. The vast majority of people who stored property at the Hatton Garden Safe Deposit Company were traders in London's jewellery quarter, with much of their wealth tied up in goods. I have been through the door every single day, or certainly three or four times a week for 45 years. My wife and I were sitting in the car and uh, listened to the BBC. Just before 6.30, the last thing on the news was the fact that Haddon Garden safe deposit had been done and lots of the deposit boxes had been opened. The flying squad phoned and said my box was opened and empty. It was quite a big part of my pension that was sitting in there or had been sitting in there, which was now gone. I needed to see my box, which I did. Box 998, completely broken and empty. The biggest shock was the size, to see the size of the actual hole. Honestly, only a very small, very slender person could get through that hole. It was tiny. I could get my head through and half my shoulders. I could certainly not get through there. They've gone into um, this vault and they've stolen people's property. The objective was to enrich themselves by stealing other people's um, valuables. You've got to remember throughout that it is, it's not a victimless crime, this. They have gone in, they were decided that they are going to enrich themselves, get their pension from other people. The Hatton Garden investigation was a classic case of cops and robbers. Would the flying squad catch the gang before they got rid of their haul? Early speculation suggested a heist of this size and ambition could only have been pulled off by a criminal gang with the right connections to move the loot on. The first clues would come from piecing together CCTV footage. The CCTV um, that's, that's obtained um, initially, we have that within uh, a few hours uh, on the first day. We look through that um, and we establish that they've been there twice. Cameras around Hatton Garden captured almost their every move, starting with the white van arriving ahead of the initial raid. Then, the thieves with their builders' outfits and wheelie bins making their way in through the fire escape, with the elusive Basil dressed all in blue, and the van leaving after the fouled first attempt when things started to go wrong. They've planned for three years, they've not been able to get in, it's a big payday and then they've just started to take risks. You know, they've not thought through what we're doing next. Despite the setbacks, some returned for the second attempt, again entering through the fire escape, before eventually loading the van with a millions of pounds worth of stolen loot. The flying squad had the crooks in action, but who were they? Their big break in identifying them would come as a result of the thieves' critical decision to return to the crime scene that second time. That gives us a breakthrough because it led the um, CCTV officers to identify that um, on the second night they'd arrived in a Mercedes earlier. This was the squad's best lead. Detectives were able to trace that Mercedes to one John Kenny Collins. 
because John Collins was using his own vehicle, it was a Mercedes E200, very distinctive um, and very few of them on the road. It had a black roof, black wheels, and so even the grainy CCTV that probably normally wouldn't be of, of a high evidential value uh, identified and we were able to track that car. You just got to wait until you get something that is concrete and tangible and you know is a good start point, which is what the Mercedes and Collins was, and then you commit your resources down that line. The flying squad put Collins under surveillance. Collins quickly led them to other members of the gang. Covert officers captured him meeting with Brian, the master reader. They were watching as the men met in calves and pubs. The group were coming together. It was now a, a, a game, a patience game on our part. Um, and that paid off when John Collins, Terence Perkins and um, Brian Reader met on a Friday night in the Castle Public House to, we say, discuss what had taken place. Perkins and Collins were telling Brian Reader when they went back how they were successful in the end. Detectives also planted electronic listening bugs on two cars used by the gang, including Collins' Mercedes. It is a tactic that is used in serious crime investigations and can be quite productive. Uh, and obviously it was very productive on this occasion. We were able to obtain recordings of their conversations and we know that they were quite excited about the fact that they'd got away with such a large scale offence and it was unlikely that the police would have any idea of what had taken place or who to look for and they were quite comfortable in the fact that they were away scot-free. What are the odds? What are the odds? What a good, you good ride. The men couldn't help boasting and bragging about what they'd done. Totally unaware, the police were listening to every word. The audio recordings of the conversation, which told us exactly how they'd done it, who they'd done it with, uh, how they're going to sort out the property. So for us, obviously, it was a gold mine of um, evidence and information as to what they're up to. What they were up to is known in criminal circles as the slaughter. Slaughter is a place where you meet afterwards and you share out the loot, basically. And everyone gets their share, because it's amazing. You know, you're looking at it and you think, I'm the, I've earned more than the Prime Minister at this time. You know, I'm a rock star. When you've got such tremendous quantities of, of loot to get rid of, it does become then a problem of how they then break it all up? How do they share it between themselves? How do they launder it and change everything into cash? After the heist, the gang members who'd been at the vault on the second night started to distribute their haul. The icing on the cake. Some of the, the, the main players, some of the older guys, really made their reputations as people who could shift stolen goods. That's what they did. That was their skill going back many decades. Worth working over the Easter weekends, <laughs> what do you reckon? Oh, I reckon it was a good night. In May, around six weeks after the heist, it was time for the exchange. Possibly thinking the heat had died down, Collins arranged for members of the gang to gather a substantial amount of the loot to redistribute. Here he is on CCTV scouting out the location with his dog, Dempsey. At the pub car park in Enfield, North London, he met a long-time friend. This man, Hugh Doyle, who runs a business next door to the car park. Police believed that the 42-year-old let them use the yard to transfer the loot. Now, the reason why they wanted to do it in that area was because they didn't want to do a boot-to-boot -boot in the street. So if they did a boot-to-boot -boot exchange within the street, it potentially looked like a drugs deal to a passing uh, police officer or a member of the public, and obviously they could lose everything that they've worked for for three years over a simple error like that. So they wanted to use that car park area because it gave them some degree of privacy. Obviously, they didn't realise that it was covered by a camera. They didn't know that we were following them. 
The exchange itself happened the following day. This too was recorded on CCTV. Collins arrived on the scene along with another of the ringleaders, Daniel Jones, who wore shorts for the occasion. You know at this point that um, this is the day that you are hoping that this is going to be right. The adrenaline is, let's hope that we were actually going to find something here because it'd be one thing to arrest the group together, but what we wanted was property. Enter two more characters. William Lincoln was, the police believed, recruited prior to the burglary to help transport and conceal the main loot. And to have recruited his nephew, John Harbinson, as a taxi driver to also help with transport. Harbinson was also alleged to have been storing a large amount of the loot after the initial slaughter. This was said to be the moment that three bags containing diamonds, watches and necklaces were shifted from John Harbinson's taxi to Collins' Mercedes. The three bags that have been exchanged behind uh, the, the pub contained at this point uh, an estimated two to four million pounds worth of diamonds and gold. With the exchange done, Collins and Jones drove off with a boot full of loot. In the same distinctive Mercedes, Collins had driven to Hatton Garden on the second night of the heist, which we now know was the beginning of the gang's undoing. The pair drove to a nearby property with the flying squad on their towel. We had weeks of surveillance showing the principals meeting up. We had the audio recording saying what they'd done and how they were going to do it. And eventually we had some property coming out of the woodwork. So at that point, we'd got sufficient there. There'd be no reason to delay the rest any longer. So uh, that was why we made a decision at that point to go in. The police made their move. In coordinated raids with more than 200 officers, they hit 12 addresses in London and Kent, including the home of Brian, the master reader. In his house, a diamond tester and a book on the diamond underworld. It was very important because obviously they can dispose of property, you know, they could disappear. You know, we don't know what each of them had at that point in time anything could happen, so it was key to arrest any of the principal conspirators at that point in time. Police also nicked Collins and Perkins, along with Jones. In the group's possession were the three holdalls from the car park exchange containing millions of pounds worth of loot. A search of Collins's house revealed a large amount of cash, watches, jewellery and a money counter. At Jones's property, police found face masks, a drill, and cash. With Perkins, they found jewellery, cash, blue overalls, and white gloves. They were surprised, obviously very disappointed. They would still have been, no doubt, actively in their minds trying to work out how they're going to minimise their criminal responsibility. It's not until they're interviewed and they obviously will walk through the evidence that we had against them that they realised how comprehensive the investigation had been against them and the amount of trouble that they were in at that point in time. The aftermath is, is, is a bit of a surprise that the, the loot was still in, in their homes. That's kind of surprising given the professionalism and the care uh, that, uh, that the crime had actually been carried out with. Um, it's a bit surprising that there wasn't more professionalism in the moving on of the goods afterwards. They've been focused on how they get in, not leaving any forensics. Those kinds of details which prove in their minds that you are a professional. But actually, it's the banal details that really makes one into a professional criminal that really would have ensured that they weren't caught. Several other men were also picked up as part of the raids. William Lincoln denied any involvement with the heist and said he was given three bags by Collins and told they contained paperwork and bric-a-brac. 
John Harbinson was also arrested, but denied knowing what was in the bags, claiming his uncle told him it was a load of old shit. In his defense, Hugh Doyle said he had no idea what the ringleaders were planning and no knowledge of what was taking place. This man was also arrested, Carl Wood. The prosecution alleged he was at the burglary on both nights, but didn't go inside on the second visit because he bottled it. He denied ever being at the heist. It was nice for people like Perkins and Jones to see Brian Reader sitting in the same police station as them, because they're going to be sitting there thinking, how's he got here? Obviously, they just stay deadpan because they, you know, they're, they're experienced criminals. They're not going to give anything away within a police station or acknowledge other people. So it's just deadpan. Don't know who it is. With arrests made, police could interview their suspects. They weren't saying much. Were you a driller? No comment. Were you the person that could deactivate the lift shafts? No comment. The alarm systems? <coughs> no comment. Was it you that messed up? No comment. It was your role, wasn't it, to um, get through the hole? No comment. They provided, in, in the main, no comment interviews uh, uh, regarding what happened. Daniel Jones, when interviewed, listened to recordings of him and Perkins talking in the car, and I think it was at that point that he realised the game was up for him. Jones and the three other ringleaders, Reader, Collins and Perkins, saw the writing on the wall and confessed. To have four who spent three years in the planning for this offence to plead before going to trial basically shows and is rewarding enough for us to say that we've done the right job and we're starting to do the right thing for the victims. <laughs> that some of that is mine. Police had recovered some of the stolen property and they had their four ringleaders. The others, Carl Wood, William Lincoln, John Harbinson and Hugh Doyle, all pleaded not guilty and went on trial. The case, lasting around six weeks, finished today. Wood and Lincoln have both been convicted of their roles. They played their part in conspiring to pull off Britain's biggest heist. Doyle was cleared of conspiracy to conceal, but found guilty of concealing property. John Harbinson was cleared of all charges. Today marked the culmination of one of the most notorious capers in British criminal history. A 
truly audacious plot, masterminded by a cunning gang of pensioners. Foiled by the gritty determination of the flying squad's elite thief takers. They would see themselves at the, the top end of criminality, and I think from that they're sensible enough to know that the flying squad is at the top end of police investigation. They planned the job well, they then hit a barrier, they made mistakes, and then they got themselves caught. I think that there's certainly an element of them thinking this was old school crime and that once they were out of the building they were home and free. It's as if life ceased to exist beyond carrying out this crime, three years in the build-up, carrying out the crime, and, and they hadn't thought past that. There's a nostalgia for the pre-drugs era where people use their brains and a bit of daring. That's been the attraction. The fact that it didn't work, and most of them got cold, and a large amount of the money has been recovered, a large amount of goods have been recovered, um, it's almost been put aside. The Nearly story is a better story. The one we almost pulled off is a tale that has more dramatic entertainment value, makes them more into heroes. If they'd got away with it, it's a different story, but they didn't. Their plan unraveled quite spectacularly at the end of the day. There was a number of flaws in how they operated and perhaps their age is a reason why. I think we have to make one thing really clear. They're very audacious, which has captured the, uh, the attention of the public. But however, these are callous thieves. The guilty men are now serving time. Well, all except one, that is. Basil, or whatever his real name is, seems to have got away with it, for now. He's still out there somewhere, along with 10 million pounds of missing loot. Obviously, we're gonna still continue looking for Basil. You know, the investigation's not completed, even though we don't have convictions. There are the number of avenues of inquiry have still got left. It's work out who Basil is and see if we can get him to court. It's identifying the outstanding property. So although we've got to this stage, which is a nice point in the investigation, there is still lots of work to do on it. And one of them is catch Basil. It's interesting that they're not giving him up. Um, I wonder what that's about and whether there's there's more to the story than, than we know. There's a certain amount of frustration. They won't cease until, obviously, they complete their investigation. Um, and that would be the tenacity and their drive. Uh, uh, you know, I've got every confidence that they will actually get there. That's all part of the myth of a good heist, someone not being captured, which put that alongside the missing loot, you've got stories for, for, for generations.